All right. Well, it's looking like it is precisely noon. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with our intro. Others will be joining. And then if you miss any bits, uh, we'll have this recording posted afterwards. Um, but welcome. Uh, I'm Damon Woods, the interim director here at the Integrated Design Lab. Uh, we're really dedicated to education, outreach, technical support of high performance buildings. Um, we've got a, a great and growing uh, crop of graduate students here. Um, Ken Baker, uh, my uh, good mentor um, and previous director, is now transitioning towards retirement, building his own uh, high performance house up in Idaho City. Um, grateful to still have him on, on board. Um, moving on, some of the things that we offer. Um, this lecture series is, is one of the funded programs through Idaho Power to increase the energy efficiency of buildings here in the Treasure Valley um, and in the greater Idaho Power Service Territory. Another opportunity that exists beyond these trainings is our Technical Design Assistance Program. Uh, so this is available to anyone within Idaho Power Service Territory. There's a few different phases of support. Um, uh, sorry. Um, phase one is, you know, very simple projects, um, you know, basic walkthroughs and things like that. Phase two is a, a little bit more involved, maybe some basic simulations and things like that. And this isn't us trying to step on the toes of any consultants. We're really trying to train you and your firms on how you can, uh, you know, take, take this knowledge and use it internally in the future. If it's going to be a very heavily involved project, um, we're, we're just starting one right now where it's a uh, you know, really detailed technical assistance, um, then there's a cost share. But phase one and phase two, that's paid for entirely by Idaho Power, which is great. Uh, phase three, there's a cost share where Idaho Power covers 75%, and then the other 25% is covered by the owner. But, you know, we're, we're grad students and, and faculty, so we're fairly cheap. And once again, our goal is to really assist you uh, to increase your own capabilities in energy efficient design. Uh, we host this visa group, so I'm excited to have everybody online. Um, we also have a lunch and learn program that's kind of been on hold with COVID. Um, we've done a, a number of kind of open sessions uh, right now for, for the fall. We'll be working on a couple of new topics, but we're also taking any requests if, uh, if your firm would like a a uh, topic delivered specifically to you, targeted at your projects, um, reach out to us. You can look on our website for the, the list of topics that we're offering, uh, get CEUs for those, um, and then we'll do a, a Zoom, uh, a live Zoom specifically with your firm. So let us know. In terms of BSUGs, we've got two more to wrap up this year. Um, we've got one on luminaire level lighting controls. We recently retrofitted our office here uh, with LLLCs. And so we'll do kind of a, a live Zoom demonstration on that. So excited uh, to present that. And then in October, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Cooper, our former director, will be sharing some of her research that she's doing at University College London on indoor air quality, specifically in the time of, of COVID. Then November, we've got our stakeholders meeting uh, on ways that we can serve you, our, our BSEG community, uh, better in the future. Don't forget about our energy resource library. Uh, we can do uh, contactless um, pickup and drop off. So you just come to our parking garage, we'll wheel out a cart and pop them in your trunk. Uh, and this is a whole suite of tools that are free to anyone in Idaho Power Service Territory that's trying to diagnose a building's performance. Uh, or maybe you're just installed a new needlepoint bipolar ionization and you need some ozone measurement. Uh, we now have some ozone measuring devices. We've got, maybe you need to do a virtual walkthrough of a space. We've got these Musix glasses with like a live Zoom link. Uh, so you can kind of work with somebody that's at a different facility that might not allow contact with uh, COVID. Um, you know, lots of things on indoor air quality measurement, which is very important right now, in addition to envelope and things like that. Anyway, lots of fun, fun tools out there. 
Uh, and in addition to those Idaho power supported programs, they have their own commercial and industrial energy efficiency program for both new construction and major retrofits. Uh, if you have any questions on those, please reach out to them at idahopower.com slash business uh, if for custom projects, for flexible peak demand response program, uh, lots of opportunities there. Uh, they did have a new program rollout on June 15th. So look at some of those updated incentives, uh, some of which increased from uh, previous ones. All right, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and allow our main presenter to start sharing her screen. Uh, and I'll give a quick introduction for Kyleen Rockwell. Uh, very happy to have her here. So thank you for your time. So Kyleen is a senior sustainable engineer and architect at HKS. She currently serves on a number of, of boards and committees, including the Lead Energy and Atmosphere Technical Advisory Group, uh, the ASHRAE 90.1 Standing Committee, the Board of Directors for IBIPSA USA, and volunteers both locally and nationally with AIA on sustainability, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues. So with degrees from Rensselaer Polytechnic and Illinois Institute of Technology, Kyleen has a strong track record of designing and implementing design strategies that improve the built environment for, for all stakeholders. Um, really blending engineering and architecture to evaluate a building's performance. And performance, not just from an energy standpoint, but also how the design will serve people's lives within the building in terms of their comfort and uh, their, their performance, but also the broader community surrounding that structure. So Kyleen, uh, thank you so much for being willing to share your time and your knowledge with our community today. Uh, really appreciate you being here. And just a, a note for attendees, um, if you wouldn't mind, um, if you have questions, let's hold those till the end of the presentation, but you are welcome to put them in the chat in the meantime, and we'll be reading from the chat uh, when Kyleen is, is done with her main presentation, and we'll have some Q&A time there. So, uh, Kyleen, I'll go ahead and, and mute myself and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Um, that was a great introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about automated two-dimensional heat transfer using Grasshopper. Um, I didn't realize I, there was going to be such a robust introduction, so I don't think I actually need to cover anything else that's on this, on this intro page for myself, so we're saving time. And there should be plenty of time at the end of this presentation for questions um, related to the content. Uh, the learning objectives will be to have an understanding of the workflow that I've created uh, to do this heat transfer analysis, have a better understanding of um, the visualization opportunities um, from the workflow, look at co collaboration and benefits of um, using this in design as a tool, and also understanding what type of restraints are on simulation tools and software that we'll be discussing. Um, so I'll be really going a deep, going into a deep dive on the individual steps of the workflow uh, to give you a sense of how it's how it's done. Um, and then the latter portion of the presentation is going to be a real world case study of using this thermal analysis workflow to inform design and installation um, of a current curtain wall system. Uh, so just a little acknowledgement here, um, anyone who's involved with Ladybug Tools, it's an open source platform and that's going to be the majority of the tools that are used uh, in that grasshopper portion of the presentation. Uh, so it's just a great way and community to, I think, learn and grow um, your semi scripting skills in the building performance industry. Uh, just a couple of key terms that um, I'll be referencing in the presentation. The first one is the interoperable algorithmic modeling or IAM. That's a self-coined word that I created for this, uh, which was basically just meant to be using various software platforms, um, weaving them together to streamline a process and workflow. And then the second term is heat transfer analysis. So here we're talking about the two-dimensional conduction of heat um, using the finite element method. 
Okay. And so just to give a little context to how this I am workflow developed, I started my current role at HKS, which is an architecture firm about four years ago. And very quickly, we realized that um, there was a need for a more efficient thermal analysis workflow. Um, it was basically we were introducing a new skill set into the firm to do this type of thermal analysis and look at our building details um, to determine whether they're vulnerable to condensation. Um, but, you know, we are a large practice with a lot, a lot of projects that so we're trying to find a way to do this efficiently. Uh, we still do use consultants for a lot of our thermal analysis work, but we found the benefits of having some of that skill set in house, which is having a faster dialogue and communication um, to better um, transfer actual results into our building details. So this workflow was really born out of a need to run analysis quickly, um, be able to make minor changes um, kind of live and then also creating some type of brandable output graphic that was all in a streamlined process. Uh, so here's an outline of the workflow. Basically, uh, we'll be drawing that detail in Rhino uh, and then using the Grasshopper plugin for Rhino to basically run the guts of the whole operation. So it's gonna be through Grasshopper with a script that will be interfacing with LBNL's Therm software, which is still doing the actual calculation and analysis. Um, but then those results get fed back into Grasshopper and visualizations will be produced that will be generated into a standardized report template. Uh, a couple things to note with the workflow, it at least, the script I have, it does not work with Rhino 7, so you would have to use Rhino 6. Um, and also for the generate report, I use InDesign for my reports, but I think that's an easy step where you could swap in whatever type of reporting format you're comfortable with. So it could be Word, it could be PowerPoint. Um, and you'll see how maybe that could be customized per each user. Okay. And so this is just looking at our first step of what's happening in Rhino to draft that detail. Uh, so the Rhino interface is replacing drawing that detail in Therm. And for those who have used Therm, I think you'll find it a lot easier to draw within Rhino, um, especially for those coming from an architecture background and having used this type of drafting software before. Uh, but some key things to keep in mind, uh, having a grid on your drawing canvas is critical. Snapping to that grid is it's similar to Therm. You really wanna make sure you're closing all boundaries of your geometry. We don't wanna see any overlapping surfaces or holes in the model. So those are just some of the, the basic drawing basics for this uh, procedure. Uh, you can start to see on the right side of the screen here, I have the layer structure that's within Rhino. Uh, and so here, each layer um, of material will have a unique name and then just simply assigning the material from your Rhino canvas to the right material um, layer name in Rhino. That's gonna kind of pop up in the next step of how we start to assign material properties correctly. And so once your material is assigned, the last step that I generally do is draw the boundary conditions. And so you'll um, be able to, I use a polyline to draw an exterior boundary condition as well as an interior boundary condition for my geometry. Uh, any part of the detail that doesn't have a specified boundary condition will just be left adiabatic. I think similar to how, how Therm operates. Uh, you do also have the option of multiple uh, boundary conditions. So there's been some times where I've had, you know, two different interior conditions. Maybe one is the occupied zone and then the other one could be a plenum type of condition. Uh, so you do have that flexibility as well. Okay, um, so this is the big screenshot of the grasshopper canvas. Um, so might seem a little daunting if you haven't seen Grasshopper before, but we'll be zooming in on the different key steps of the script. 
Um, but Grasshopper, I think, is a really great tool for allowing those without computer programming expertise to begin to, you know, adapt a script from that open community and forum. There's a lot of um, templates that you can start off at, use, um, and then just adapt it for any type of analysis that you'd like to do for the project. So this um, second phase of the workflow, looking at this Grasshopper script, it's Holistically, it's taking the geometry from Rhino, assigning properties, running the analysis, and then creating um, standardized outputs. So I'll go into each of those steps. This is kind of that first step of selecting materials. Um, you can customize material conductivity values. Um, if you're, so it's referencing the layer name that we had in Rhino to bring in the geometry and then either creating a custom material to assign properties to that, um, that layer, or you can uh, tap into the database of materials that Therm has or the database um, that Honeybee has, which is another Grasshopper plugin uh, that's part of the Ladybug tool suite. Uh, in this step, while we're you know, bringing in every layer, there's the panel of green on the right. Um, it's also going to be assigning a specific color to each material. And we'll see that later in the outputs, um, what that does for visualization. Uh, that next critical input is going to be assigning boundary conditions to the model um, here. At our firm, we generally reach out to the MEP engineers uh, for the project to make sure that we're using the correct interior conditions. So having the dry bulb and relative humidity set points for the space will be critical because that's going to tell us where what the dew point temperature is, where we're really concerned. Um, but then you also do put in your exterior design condition. And those temperature profiles will be mapped onto uh, your thermal analysis model. Okay. Uh, this middle section here in the in the dotted red line, that's going to be where basically the script is running uh, the file, um, sending it to Therm and back um, to the Grasshopper, Grasshopper file once it's run. Um, there are some things uh, you might have to change some of your default settings in Therm the first time you ever use this workflow. Um, most of those, some of the settings will just make sure that the right file type is coming back to Grasshopper so it can be read correctly. Um, you can even, uh, so it's gonna generate a Therm file basically at this stage. And if you want to, you can take that file into Therm, open it up in Therm and you know run the analysis in Therm if you'd like versus bringing it back into Grasshopper. Sometimes I do that just for having a peace of mind for the analysis and make sure the numbers look correct. Um, let's see. And then kind of the final step is helping with that standardized reporting procedure. So we're going to um, generate basically four outputs from this Grasshopper script. Uh, in my case, I put them into an InDesign template and I'll be basically with a click of a button. Um, what happens is we have um, saved viewport names in Rhino for these four images that are coming out. And so there's gonna be a standardized JPEG that gets put into some folder on your machine you specify um, that's gonna have these four outputs. Uh, and so here we'll just kind of go through an example of those outputs. This is the first one, which is just a legend or key of what material is assigned to what geometry in the model. This is where those color swatches when we were assigning thermal conductivity come into play. So you can just visualize that better. I say you don't really have an option like this from a, what I've seen from therm output reports. Um, this next temperature gradient should look pretty familiar for those who have done thermal analysis before. Um, I would say one of the cool things of, of using this script is that you can start to customize the palette. Uh, so for the architects in the room, you can, you know, 
put in whatever type of color combinations you'd like to see. So you're not just stuck with the standard um, colors by default. Uh, this next is just highlighting, like culling the information and pulling where the dew point temperature occurs within the wall assembly. Um, so that's gonna be kind of where the, the black, uh, black boundary is created. It's gonna be the dew point temperature or lower. So having a way to visualize that will be, I think, important as you wanna see if your interior error has any means of touching that dew point and if condensation might occur. And then the fourth graphic is just looking at heat flux or how much energy is going through. Um, and so this is gonna highlight where your thermal um, breaks will occur in the assembly. Again, with any of those charts, you can customize the graphics and colors, which my firm is <laughs> really a fan of. Um, and then just going quickly over that standard report that I've created in InDesign, just having an easy uh, cover, executive summary, it makes it pretty easy to um, generate these reports for quite a few projects and make sure that it's kind of in a consistent manner that um, team members are used to seeing. You can always go in and place in different images from different runs um, pretty easily. And because those images have been standardized to a set viewport and pixel aspect ratio, it's, I think it's easy to just swap in and replace images in the analysis. Um, but typically we'll just set up, you know, identifying the detail, um, explaining or showing the temperature gradient with where that dew point occurs is a critical part. Um, having the option to look at multiple details that are similar with variations in the same format. So you can kind of toggle and see the differences. Uh, and then uh, I think I'll go into this a little bit more in my case study, this last graph. So you'll see it a little bigger, um, but we also do um, a cumulative fre frequency chart to show the dry bulb temperature, just putting into perspective when that exterior design condition occurs and maybe how much of a risk um, or occurrence that is actually gonna occur for your building. Okay. Uh, so for the overall workflow that I've covered, I think some of the advantages that we find um, versus what I'm gonna call the traditional workflow, which would just be using Therm, um, is that right with this IM workflow, you're gonna have a more designer-friendly geometry creation Right, so within Rhino, you can import DWGs, which you can do in Therm as well, but I think it's much smoother uh, using the Rhino interface to kind of create that geometry. Um, another difference I would say is having ways to customize visualization of where that dew point is, um, and also customizing any of the, the results that you'd like to see. You can really start to dig deeper into some of that data as well. Um, I think basically every mesh point, you can get exactly what that temperature um, temperature is within the assembly for the simulation you're running. Um, and then having a more customizable, branded, automated generation of reports um, is I think helpful for an efficient workflow. Okay. So that first section hopefully covers uh, the workflow and how it's uh, working. Uh, we'll definitely probably be some questions later about some of the details and nuances of it, but I do want to go into a case study now of, you know, how did this actually help us on a project? How did you we adapt the workflow um, to suit our needs? Okay. Uh, so this Case study is going to be about uh, a condensation risk assessment for a hospital in Minneapolis that was built in 2005. What ended up happening was the original specified and installed glass and framing has long been um, a source of condensation issues in the hospital. Of course, this is a cold climate, but it's also a humidified interior program, which is going to be the, the perfect um, recipe for condensation risk. And so 
I think this was back in fall 2008 um, when we were brought on board to kind of help come up with a solution and replace the existing curtain wall with a new curtain wall that could perform at these design conditions. But what the client was seeing was in the existing condition that whenever the temperatures outside fell below zero degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the windows would start to sweat. Um, condensation would occur so much that the staff started to keep towels on the windowsills. So then they're worried about having slip, um, slip, slippery floors because of the condensation, air quality issues because they've got these damp towels just sitting there. Um, so there was a lot of issues with the old um, performance of the wall. And basically that fall, we were gonna have a new project replacing all the punch windows and curtain wall and the team and client wanted to make sure that what we were gonna be proposing in terms of mitigating condensation would actually work before they went and you know, purchased material and installed it all. Uh, so here, um, just a little bit about the condensation resistance factor. I think um, some, a lot of practicing architects and designers are familiar with the CRF, um, but we we have it in our specifications basically for any projects, but it's going to be looking at taking your exterior and interior design conditions and sets a minimum product performance for your glass and framing that technically, I guess, would be like there's no condensation um, risk associated. Um, the original specifications for the project I think they somehow they didn't have the right indoor relative humidity dialed in for a hospital. So it ended up having a CRF that was um, lower than what the ASHRAE design condition should have been uh, for that project. Ultimately, with what we were proposing, we, we had a CRF that was well and above um, both ASHRAE as well as what the client was hoping uh, to use as an exterior design condition. But I think also that this page is just a, a lesson that CRF is not the end all and be all of whether you're going to have condensation in your building envelope. Um, really have to take a better look at the detailing and doing this type of thermal analysis to see where does that dew point occur and if that's going to be an issue uh, for condensation. Uh, so the next series of slides, we're looking at one of the vulnerable details of um, of the proposed replacement. Um, the punch windows were really a pretty easy, uh, we swapped in a better better framing system and, gla and glass, and there was really no risk of condensation at the design conditions. But the curtain wall was uh, a bit more of a challenge for the team. Uh, so on this page here, you'll see all the details uh, have the same uh, fenestration framing system which was a, a pretty well thermally broken system. And in what, ac what actually changes in each detail is gonna be how the insulation is addressed. Uh, the image on the left was what we thought the built assembly was based on shop drawings from 2005. It was supposed to be, I think about two inches of continuous insulation in that spandrel panel, and then a bat filled stud cavity behind it. Uh, what ended up being discovered as what was actually built was just uh, the two inches of continuous insulation, uh, which is in that middle example. And then the third detail is ultimately the architectural design that we went with, which was to put in um, a, a specific spandrel panel that would allow us to fill up the whole depth of that uh, spandrel panel with continuous insulation butting up right against the, the panel itself. Um, and then we didn't put any bat insulation into the stud cavity. And so when I toggle here, so we're looking at the thermal analysis of those different details. Um, I think there's some interesting takeaways based on the, the slight differences between each of these uh, spandrel panel details. You might first notice that with or without 
the the stud um, back cavity. Not having that cavity insulation actually helps our project because it's going to allow that interior air to better warm up the back of the spandrel panel. Um, going to toggle here uh, to where we where we basically drew that dew point line in each detail, so you can see. In, um, with the bat filled cavity, that dew point line does go slightly more out um, towards the exterior. However, in both scenarios, we're still dealing with a dew point that is occurring within the stud cavity where air, interior air could hit that and condense. And then our final architectural decision on the right was the, um, the MAPE spandrel panel where um, we're very close to getting that dew point to go completely outboard, but it still wasn't a guarantee that there wouldn't be condensation. Uh, so kind of, we were at, I guess, our limitations arch architecturally for what, what we could do um, with, you know, framing and insulation. And so our next step was getting an understanding of how often this risk occurred and maybe what type of operational impacts we'd have to change to be able to address them. And this is, I think, really where um, the IM workflow helped us out because it's it was very easy to change um, the boundary conditions, rerun a model. It takes you know less than a minute to kind of do that and have um, a generation of output images all all being kind of uniform and put into a central repository. Um, but basically with these operational impacts, what we were testing um, was we kept that MAPE spandrel panel because that was the best architectural means of designing the detail. But then we, um, I kept the example on the left, that's the ASHRAE design conditions, or I should no, that was the design conditions with the negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, which the owner was hoping Basically, I think it's like seven degrees colder than what ASHRAE would recommend for that climate. Uh, we're hoping for a little bit of safety and redundancy, I guess, with that colder design day temperature. Um, the middle scenario, you'll see we ran with, I'll just, um, I guess the middle scenario, we used a negative six degrees Fahrenheit exterior. That was the tipping point for this detail of what pushed the dew point outboard if we didn't change the interior conditions. And then the instance on the right was, um, if we kept that negative 22 exterior, what did we have to change that interior dew point to? Basically how much you'd have to adjust the relative humidity down to, to get a dew point temperature that also occurred outboard. So looking at the thermal images of these different scenarios, um, you can see, the image on the left, that's that negative 22 with exterior with a 37 degree dew point. Um, gonna switch so you can actually see where the dew point occurs in these details. So that was what we had seen earlier when we were looking at architectural insulation options. Still not a foolproof um, guarantee of no condensation because that dew point's occurring in the stud cavity. Uh, the middle scenario that was what we saw as the tipping point, negative six degrees would be when um, basically if the temperature was negative six or lower, you'd have the dew point um, in a problematic area. And then if we go back and say, basically whenever the temperature is less than negative six or less than negative 22, um, what do we need to change our interior conditioning to to make sure that our dew point is okay? And we played around with different humidity levels and basically got to a dew point that had to be 31 degrees or lower to be okay. So this starts to really inform an operational strategy for the en engineering team of the building or the facilities team so that they can start to get a sense that, you know, when temperature is below negative six degrees Fahrenheit, um, we should be dropping our dew point temperature if we really want to ensure no condensation is going to occur. Uh, so this was a, a, just another quick plug to the workflow of, you know, we were on live Zoom meetings with um, a lot of the team members and, you know, adjusting boundary conditions live and 
change, playing around with those installation options um, with quick feedback on what would be possible for the design or not. And then I promise I kind of refer back to this um, uh, cumulative frequency graph here that we keep at the end of our reports, but it's really to help assess the risk, um, especially as we start to look at some of those operational changes I think it helps to get a sense of how much this might be a problem in your typical year. So that negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit um, exterior condition occurs for 0.05% of the annual hours of the year. So the little tiny point um, on the very left. And then that negative six degrees threshold for you know when we might have to start making adjustments to our interior dew point. That's going to be 1.3% of the year, or about 177 hours. So that I think really gave the client a better sense of, okay, like we do have a means of fixing the condensation with operational changes because the architecture was not quite able to do that for us. Um, and then having a sense of, you know, that's going to be for a handful of hours for the year, that condensation could be a possible risk. Uh, this is a second piece, um, a bit of a curveball that got thrown to us that winter as they were replacing the facade. Um, so I think this is like 2019 winter now where um, we had one of those polar vortex type of weeks um, and they were in the midst of replacing the facades. So there were some old and some new um, areas of the curtain wall. Um, I included my favorite screenshot from that period of like frozen noodles. <laughs> Um, but basically we got our design day. And so I think um, as those who are maybe modelers or analysts, we also got a dreaded email from the owner that um, I copied the text on the left of the slide, but basically they had you know, a cold wave. He got his temperature sensor out and started taking measurements and wanted to validate that the measurements he was seeing was what we were getting in our model um, just to still have I guess even more peace of mind of that what we were um, simulating was pretty close to what was happening uh, in the real world. So we we basically had to verify um, their field measurements um, within our simulation process to try to match the temperatures that they're getting. And he gave us some uh, details. Uh, so he gave us the surface interior temperatures. Um, at the framing and glass, and then also provided us that at the time we took the measurements, it was actually negative 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, also provided the winds, although I don't know how he got that wind temperature or wind speed, but that would, that I think I did adjust the film coefficient based on that wind. Um, but then ultimately, you know, we took his, his temperature measurements adjusted our boundary condition to that like negative 27 degrees on the day he took the measurements um, and updated the model to try to see if the temperature readings we were getting in our therm model or thermal analysis model uh, matched up with his surface reading temperatures. Um, uh, let me see, ultimately we did, you know, I guess everyone was pleased with the, they weren't exactly, the same temperatures, which I don't think you would ever expect real world numbers to match up with a simulated um, type of condition or analysis that predicts surface temperatures. Uh, but generally we were, um, we were seeing the delta temperature between exists between actual and um, simulated results were the same. So that we're, we're kind of seeing the same delta between exterior and interior temperatures which was a good sign. And I think we were a couple degrees off ultimately, um, like a decree, degree or two off with the measured surface temperatures and the simulated surface temperatures. And I think this was an understanding for the team that you know they're not expecting them to line up exactly. There's limitations in the 2D modeling that aren't gonna capture the airflows of the room or the facade. Even at that time, when we were looking at the, the temperatures of the new curtain wall system, it wasn't buttoned up all the way. So insulation was still happening. So there's perhaps still airflow going through the cavity that in the, the 
I guess, 100% built condition may not be there. Uh, but we did feel like this gave it um, more credibility that simulation was a good predictive indicator of that condensation risk. Um, let's see, just a couple of conclusions here. Um, I think the integrated team really did benefit from, from some of these live changes. Because in that previous example where we looked at um, what the, the owner also measured, the old curtain wall system, and we simulated the old curtain wall system as well uh, using um, kind of assumptions for what I thought the U value of that framing and glazing system was. Um, but it was actually the, the glass subcontractor when we were going over that analysis informed me because I didn't realize that glass from 2005 um, was actually pretty drastically different from um, glass that we see that I've seen my whole professional career with like a center of glass U, U value of 0.29, like 2005 glass is much worse than that. So that made a big difference when we were running the model um, and being able to change that quickly was important as well. And I think just, I think in the course of this, you know, couple of months and looking at design options, um, we probably had five meetings where we had five reports um, and so having that standardized report template was really easy to start to swap out the details that we were studying. Um, so I've covered everything I was hoping to cover today, and I'm happy, happy to go back to any slides if people have questions back on the actual workflow itself or how we, um, how we might use this type of analysis in practice. Thank you so much, Eileen. That was just very informative and I'm excited to, I'll, I'll be reaching out um, asking about how we can incorporate this workflow because I for one have always struggled with the uh, therm geometry input, as you said, um, and being able to standardize some of the graphics, especially showing that dew point line. Like you said, the pixelation or the delay that can occur in therm is, is really rough. Um, so this is a really beautiful workflow and I'm so glad that you developed this and, and thanks for um, sharing it. Um, I'll just open this up to our participants. Um, you know, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Eileen questions. Uh, you're also welcome to put them in the chat. Um, it looks like there is one question from Paul James, um, which is asking, can you assess the moisture generation rate using this workflow? Um, I'm not actually sure what moisture generation rate is. Um, I don't know if that's referring more to like vapor drive and like cumulative moisture over time. Uh, maybe, maybe you can clarify. To my knowledge, no, but I don't really know what that term is. <laughs> Paul, feel free to chime mm -hmm. in. And... Okay, yeah, so over time, um, no. So like the, I would say the, the thermal analysis we're looking at is really just this, I guess, a finite element looking at one point in time. So we, we choose um, like basically looking at the coldest day of the year with is exactly this interior conditions. But I think if you start to look at um, vapor drive and if, if moisture is gonna accumulate or evaporate within the assembly, that would have to be going into a hydro hydrothermal like software like Woofy, um, which would, you know, you can model your assembly over three years and start to get a better sense of that moisture um, generation rate in the entire assembly. Thanks. And then there's a question from uh, Eric, which is that your workflow appears to use the legacy version of Ladybug tools. So do you have any insight into the workflow of the newer release of the software? Yeah, so that was the point I made earlier that, um, that I have to use Rhino 6 for this workflow. I've tried to um, take it into um, the newer uh, Grasshopper, which is within Rhino 7. Um, and it just, 
I, I don't know if there's some firewall that is happening within that grasshopper that's therm connection, but I can't get it to work um, with the newer version of um, Ladybug within Rhino 7. And I don't really have, I guess, I don't know if that's something um, Ladybug tool creators are addressing or trying to fix in the future. Uh, next question from uh, Derek. With Therm being two dimensional, what's your process for extrapolating or estimating a, a full 3D assembly? Mm, yeah. Um, I guess we haven't, I, we haven't really done kind of taking this 2D, basically like you'd get your U value and applying that in a three dimensional assembly. I do think like using the visualization, you can get some cool like axon diagrams um, of a section of a wall with that thermal image on it and kind of extrude the wall. I think that you could start to build up some cool graphics that way. Um, but I would still, you still kind of, if you're thinking about a 3D um, assembly you value for something, you'd have to break it down into those two dimensional ideas of plan and section and kind of do your area weighted U values for it um, with this workflow. You, I mean, you could maybe start to imagine a way that automates that um, process, um, but I haven't gotten into that. Thanks. Thanks. And then a follow-up question from uh, Paul. Is it possible to model a heat map, a heat mat within the construction, or would you use that mat as your boundary condition? Yeah, um, you, I, I would think that the workaround would be putting in the boundary condition. You, to my knowledge, you can't put some type of thermal source within um, Within that, that model, you'd have to assign a temperature to your boundary condition to try to simulate it as closely as possible. Thanks. And then uh, a follow up from Eric um, saying he had a similar issue, but Chris, one of the developers, sent him a script that works that he can mm -hmm. share. Um, that still uses the, the legacy version, but works in version seven. So um, thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, feel free to, to sh share that with, the, with our community for sure. Yeah, I think that speaks to that open community forum of the Ladybug tools. They are generally really receptive to helping as you run into problems. And then I guess in terms of sharing, I am also happy to share my um, grasshopper script and kind of the Rhino file I have that works with it, um, with those kind of save view ports. So if, if you're interested, I can send that out and people can start to play around with it. Thanks, thanks. And would you be willing to share a PDF of this presentation as well with our team? Okay, great. Then we'll post that on our uh, BSUG YouTube channel in the, the comment section there. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see that on our website for anybody else. Um, uh, so yeah, that's an answer there to um, uh, Shashwat um, that we'll, we'll have the slides posted with the recording um, on the IDL uh, BSUG YouTube site. Are, are most of your, uh, I guess, studies using this workflow focused on condensation? Do you do much on the, say, like ASHRAE 55 thermal comfort side, or is it mainly just avoiding, you know, potential mold or growth from condensation? Uh, I'd say 80% are kind of looking at condensation um, issues, really looking at our kind of detailing around the framing system as the vulnerable point. And we have a lot of healthcare projects. So that's like another um, vulnerable point in our designs. Plus it doesn't help our headquarters are in Dallas. So a lot of our older projects were in climates that were you know, not as terrible as like an asteroid climate zone five. And um, we're starting to get hospitals in colder climates and this is becoming more of an issue. Um, but the remaining portion, we don't, say so we don't really use it as a thermal comfort tool 
um, but we do use it to assess um, just overall uh, thermal performance. So we've used it to, you know, it helps sell us sell to the client us being able to use a green dirt framing system. So better um, thermally broken a framing system for metal panels than what the traditional, um, you know, metal framing would be. That makes sense. And especially those those graphics that you're producing do make it a very compelling case. It's more than just numbers. So thanks. Um, and Paul is asking um, a, a question I had as well. Um, could you talk to the CRF uh, where you were uh, mentioning uh, the, the different window condensation risks? Um, could you describe yeah. what that is, that, that term? Uh -huh. Yeah, so actually that, yeah, I guess I wasn't even familiar with that term before I started working for an architecture firm, but it is all over our specifications. Like that's kind of the, the performance criteria in our specifications for our glass and framing that um, helps, I guess, make sure that we're not going to have condensation issues. But then again, it's really not, it doesn't do that job 100% because it's, it's literally just taking the temperature of your exterior and your interior dew point. And if you Google, I think CRF resistance tool, it, I think it'll explain the formula to you, but it derives that factor and um you'll find like i mean framing manufacturers they'll they'll give you the crf factor for their system so that you just have to make sure that what you're specifying is doing better than what that site um, crf calls for but again it's not foolproof and i think that's another thing our firm has realized as we're doing more of this type of thermal analysis is that um we can't just rely on that simply for being assured that there's not going to be any issues. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Well, we've got Kylene here. Um, well, I'm going to um, 